Hello and welcome to this episode of the Print Mind Over Matter. We have a lot of guests over. Um, today's guest is extra special and I'll tell you why. Uh, welcome first, Anisha. So let me tell you more about Anisha and the work she does. So Anisha is the Chief Executive Officer of Live Love Love, a charitable trust founded in 2015 by actor Deepika Padukone. The Live Love Love Foundation aims to give hope to every person experiencing stress, anxiety and depression. Live Love Love's interventions are focused on awareness building and improving accessibility and affordability of mental health services. Since joining LLL in 2016, Anisha's leadership has enabled the foundation to deliver significant impact with focused programs and landmark initiatives. At LLL, she oversees program strategy, fundraising, collaborations and policy outreach. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so, for a lot of people, I wanted to say this bit because for a lot of people, I think Deepika is talking about um, her struggles with mental health opened up the window to actually come forward and at least say that, okay, I too have experienced similar issues or I too feel like I know somebody that I want to help with. So it's great to actually have you here to tell us more about the foundation because I know it has been doing great work uh, in such a short span of time actually and in a country like ours which I think still needs to have so much of yeah. dialogue about mental health. So um, Anisha tell us what are the uh, challenges, the structural challenges mm -hmm. when it comes to working with mental health and mental wellness in India? Sure, so firstly thank you for <laughs> having me Tina, I am glad to be here. Um, I think firstly to begin with the, uh, you know, it's important to understand that mental health is an extremely complex topic. Mm. Uh, and especially in a country like India, uh, you know, mental health is not just about the medical aspect. Uh, there are also now hmm. various other factors at play. Right. Uh, for example, social, hmm. uh, cultural or even economic factors. So, uh, all of these things, you know, add to the complexity of the topic. Hmm. Um, we've all heard, you know, that awareness and stigma uh, is a challenge. It definitely continues to remain a challenge while the needle may have begun to shift or has shifted uh, maybe in the last um, five, six years, uh, but there's still a long way to go in that uh, avenue and therefore awareness of mental health uh, and the conditions and, you know, symptom, symptomology or even just basic understanding still remains a very critical mm. challenge. That's uh, the first one. Uh, secondly, I think access, mm. uh, accessibility to, to different things So accessibility to uh, not just credible mental health professionals mm. where you can seek help and support from but also access to verified information because today there's since the mental health dialogue has shifted so much uh, there's a lot of content and information out there on mental health so how can you really separate credible information from maybe information that isn't uh, that continues to remain uh, a challenge uh, and the third part is actually the uh, uh, credible mental health professionals themselves, right? Uh, India is right now at a stage where capacity building becomes an extremely important aspect. Mm. Uh, and because there are not enough psychiatrists, there are not enough counsellors, mm. uh, for example, there isn't even a, um, a sort of a, a body that recognises who, uh, who can certify what a counsellor is or not, right? So that, that uh, is just one example of how capacity building remains also a, a critical challenge. Uh, and then lastly, um, even affordability in a country like India, given that, you know, uh, majority of the population um, doesn't have the means and the access, even if they may have the awareness hmm. uh, and, and the accessibility to some of these things. So affordability also remains a, a critical issue, affordability of not just mental health services, but even, for example, the fact that right now uh, insurance coverage doesn't come under um, uh, mental health even mm. though it has been mandated. So, I think these are some, some of the mm. challenges. Uh, of course, there are, there are plenty more, like I said, it's an extremely complex issue. Uh, but these are some of the challenges and I think working in some of these areas um, mm. for the next, you know, five to ten years for India is going to be critical. Mm. Okay. So let's talk about these two factors that you mentioned, which is accessibility and affordability, mm -hmm. right? I do understand that if you're living in a place like a Delhi, uh, at least there is a sense of accessibility. Maybe you can look up uh, on internet services, but it can still be a matter of affordability. But we don't, I feel like when we look at health, again, we don't look at it in a holistic manner, right? Like 
for us when we say health it's immediately physical health yeah. so i was wondering um because your foundation also initiates this whole uh, you have um resources at least in terms of even yeah. quote helplines and all of that right and that is also a kind of accessibility right. for example so how does one inform the other in terms of like when we think of physical health we don't think as much about the money factor probably the way we do when we're talking about mental mm-hmm. health right mm-hmm. so i was wondering how one sort of informs the other sure no you're absolutely right i think there 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 is an interlinkage between accessibility and affordability more right. so in a country like india uh, and you can't have one without having the other right right so um access like i said is not just to resources and mm. mental health professionals it's also to credible information because unless you're aware of what to do in certain situations mm. uh you you're not going to know what the next step is how how to go about whether that's seeking help whether that's basic information what you know some 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 of your basic rights are uh so i think access to credible information combined with the affordability both of them are interlinked hmm. uh, and like i said affordability is is uh one of the very critical challenges that we're facing with uh with men- with healthcare in general probably but also particularly with with mental health as well mm. uh, and the fact that uh, the population itself within our country right. uh, is so large these two terms are interlinked uh, and and therefore working in them is is extremely important okay so we know that there is always a stigma when we are talking about you know mental wellness so i'm wondering when somebody is trying to seek help right so mm-hmm. what does it is it still a certain st- like we understand that let's say 5 or 10 years from today it was m- worse like you know if i probably wouldn't be even telling my friends if i'm probably uh, seeking help or i even i need help there was so much of stigma yeah. i would say maybe slightly it has improved where i can at least say that okay i'm struggling yeah. even if i don't tell them outright what my struggle looks like right and i was wondering has that changed in some way also in terms of what are the different kind of stigma so what what does it look like for example in an urban context where i want to seek help and i'm experiencing mm-hmm. and especially in rural india because i don't think we talk about rural india as much we think still we think most of us think that mental illness is some elite disease that happens only in cities and to a certain class of people mm. and it doesn't happen to people of a certain uh, community or yeah. in villages right so sure no we've definitely come a long way right. uh, and i think a good example of that would be this interview itself right, right. i think 5 uh, 6 years ago we may not have had uh, been able to have this interview would not have had this interview uh, even the kind of work that live love laugh is doing <clears throat> you know we've been able to do it because there has been a certain uh, there has been the process of starting to accept mental health right right so uh, we we have come a long way and that needle is shifting or moving but there's there's no doubt that there's still a very long way to go because of the seriousness of the issue mm. and and how large and vast it is uh coming to the stigma aspect i think uh firstly you know it's important to note that stigma exists in both rural india as well as in urban india uh it's also important to note that very important to note rather that mental illness affects people irrespective of you know geography mm. uh gender uh, socio economic background uh sometimes there is a perception that mental illness can only affect you know a certain section of of society and that's not necessarily true uh because mental illness does not discriminate and therefore uh stigma exists both in rural and urban india as well as mental illness affects both urban and rural india now the difference is comes in the causes or the reasons why the stigma exists right so in uh urban india uh as well as in r- rural india the, the the thing to understand is that mental illness typically you know is a spectrum hmm starting off with common mental disorders and then extending into the more severe mental illnesses now while they may not be uh you know while while there is common mental disorder and severe mental disorder in both rural and urban india usually what happens is in cities or in urban india the uh help seeking behavior Mm. uh happens a little bit sooner on that spectrum right uh so maybe maybe you're more open to seeking help at a at a slightly earlier stage and mm-hmm. therefore in in a lot of cases you get help before uh whereas in rural india unfortunately again because there is no access because of the affordable affordability factor because of other uh issues people don't seek help at an earlier stage and and they're not aware and so 
a lot of the cases that you see are severe mental illness mm. right so um, once that happens in rural india because also of the uh, sim symptomology or how the symptoms play out uh, you typically see a lot more um, severe symptoms showing up for mm. example hallucinations mm -hmm. or um, uh, violent behavior and therefore because of the lack of awareness what happens is that people feel that the um, uh, the person may be you know possessed mm. they resort to uh, religious practices they are taken to faith healers uh, and so it's important to address some of the the challenges based on how the perceptions also are right uh, so in 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 urban india you're sort of more likely to seek help and support at a little bit little bit of an earlier stage mm. uh, although there is stigma uh, and in in rural india you know uh, it comes a little bit later mm. um having said that i think uh, the interventions like i said the interventions have to be tailored to the particular audience uh, and through our rural program through live love laughs rural program what we are able to see is that the impact that you can make in rural india uh, is is very vast mm. right and there there is a big scope to make that kind of impact uh because there are certain geographies or areas where we have our programs where for example people who um have severe mental illness are abandoned at maybe religious sites uh and so the need for that for supporting individuals like that uh stabilizing them integrating them back into society plays a very critical role a uh, very critical and important role which we've uh, been able to do for a lot of our uh beneficiaries and therefore uh, interventions also have to be tailored depending on mm. uh, which geography you're actually catering to so uh, i'm sort of coming back into the same concept that when somebody opens up i think what it does is validate um, for a lot of people watching that that okay this is something i can talk about or this is something i'm not sitting alone here mm. experiencing this and since the foundation started uh with dipika talking about and then deciding to do something about it which again not a lot of people were doing at all actually here so is wondering what is the foundation now doing in terms of testimonials because if that one testimonial helps so many people to at least say okay fine you know i i i see something similar happening so what is the initiative at the foundation to take it forward in a certain way is sure so we have different initiatives right. uh, i think uh, if we look back now uh, dipika speaking about her experience in some sense was a landmark right event where mental health uh, is concerned i think it opened the floodgates for people to really be able to uh, you know um, express what they are ex experiencing whether that's uh, to family and friends around or or out there in the public domain um in terms of what we are doing i think primarily we started off by uh, involving uh persons with lived experience mm. uh in our journey by creating a safe space for them to be able to share a space that is non judgmental where they feel safe to be able to share what they are going through uh we started off by doing large scale public awareness campaigns uh 2016 we did in fact india's first public awareness campaign called uh, dobara pucho mm. uh which involved individuals who had lived experience uh and i remember at that time it was quite difficult for us to convince people right uh, to be able to part to to be a part of the the campaign itself because you're talking about uh you know your face being revealed you're talking about your name your age uh, people will know who you are and these were up on you know hoardings in magazines you know all over the place so there was there were obviously some people who were resistant uh, or who were hesitant rather to to actually be a part of it but we managed to find a few people uh we did another campaign in 2018 called not ashamed which also had a similar uh premise on which uh individuals with lived experience was was a part of this so large scale awareness campaigns is one uh we also have another property on our website called stories of hope so initially when we started our website back in 15 or 16 uh we would have you know just a few stories coming in every year maybe a handful about 10 12 stories a year uh, and now we get that same amount Uh, of people sharing their narratives on a monthly basis mm. so you can clearly see the the shift mm. you know and the impact that something like that can have in addition to that you know a lot of people write into us on our uh, social media pages and and on our dms they 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 get write into us um but i think probably what is most impactful is that when when i'm you know going somewhere or when when the team is traveling or when the 
uh, the board of trustees and when somebody actually comes up to you uh, and shares their own journey right uh, that's that's really what uh, i think gives us that motivation to to do the work that we are doing and and we can see first hand the kind of impact whether that's through our circle of family or friends mm. uh, or someone that you don't know you know uh, i had recently gone out for a meal and somebody came up to me saying i went through postpartum depression uh, i got help from the foundation uh, i'm doing much better now and this is my this is my child you know so it's moments like those that mm. really um, uh, inspire us to continue doing what we are doing and there's no doubt that you know persons with lived experience uh, not just them but also caregivers i'm a caregiver myself so i understand the journey and how uh, you know sometimes that can also be challenging so focus on li- persons with lived experience and caregivers will continue to remain an important part of what we do um i think also you brought out that important bit about caregiving which i think sometimes doesn't get spoken of as much because it is the person who's going through but also somebody who's mm-hmm. right next to them supporting could you just tell us a bit about that like how i think we don't uh, talk about that a lot in terms of how it impacts somebody who's also sharing because it's yeah. their own mental health at one second they also being supportive of somebody else's correct so maybe just sure so i think uh, it it again just comes down to being aware right. uh, i felt i thought that i was someone who was reasonably aware of mental health right. I, i knew the terms and i think we're somewhere we're all guilty of that thinking we know enough right until you are uh, unfortunately in a situation where you need to help somebody hmm. uh is when you actually realize you know that i i, I don't think i actually know enough and that right. kind of can throw you off so having the right kind of awareness uh you know uh, before uh, something actually happens is is a good way to right. to be prepared because in the event then you at least know you know what are the right things to be saying what are the right things to be doing or even if it means identifying that something you know that something is off in a person and you need to s- reach out for help and and give them the support that they need because they may not they mm. may not always have uh, you know uh, the awareness to recognize it for themselves so i think caregiving is um, is again uh, it's not easy uh, but with the right kind of awareness reading up you know from uh, mental health professionals or credible resources understanding what a caregiver can do to support someone going through mental illness uh, really goes a long way because you are the backbone as a caregiver right, right. and 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 everyone a uh, person with lived experience or person with mental illness is going to fall back not just in mental health in in other we've right. seen that in other illnesses as well so uh, this is as critical as important and because there isn't as much focus on this and as mm. much awareness it becomes that much more important to be aware okay um thank you so much for sharing so many insightful points actually um i think this is a way of understanding how mental health works in structural level because a lot of us understand that we feel off quote and quote and we can go to a therapist for help or we don't feel great we can ask somebody around us for help but what is happening generally in the structure of mental health beyond the medical aspect of it more in the social aspect of it more in the interpersonal aspect of it i think anisha gave a great overview about that and if you like this episode please subscribe to our youtube channel and you can also share your feedback about not just this interview generally about what you feel about your experience of uh, dealing with mental illness or if you are somebody who is a caregiver please drop in your comments and also suggestions of what more we should do, be doing thank you